Hi there, Sean Walker. And today the video is going to be about resin formulation in <laughs> underdeveloped countries like uh, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Central and South America, where everybody gets their resin unformulated. Green resin is called. And this is my workstation. I apologize for the mess, but I do a lot of work here. And doesn't look too clean, does it? <laughs> okay, so. Uh, we're going to start out with the polyester resin. Now this polyester resin, this container here, has been formulated already by myself. You can see it's got a pinkish color to it. When you normally get it, it's green. I don't have any green resin to show you. But uh, when you get a uh, U.S. in America, it's already been formulated. It's uh, got the monostyrene and a uh, hardener accelerant added to it already and all you have to do is add the MEKP and you're good to go and there's a normally a sticker on it with the formulation uh, percentages and uh, you just measure it out and you're good to go you can do your fiberglass layup on your boats or whatever you're building and there'll be no problem but here in Thailand you get the green resin and uh, a lot of people think that's bad and if you just start working with the green resin here and you don't know what's going on, you're not going to have a good experience. I've been there. So what you got to do is figure out how to formulate your own resin. Now, in America, like I said before, you get the uh, different countries in the West, you get the uh, resin that's already formulated. You don't got to worry about anything, but there's a little bit of a problem with that. There's less flexibility in usage. They've already decided how much uh, monostyrene and how much hardener accelerant to put in it already, regardless of what you might want. If you have uh, the green resin, you can formulate it yourself and you can tailor it to your needs better. So I like the green resin once I, once I got used to it. Now another consideration with green resin and pre-formulated resin like you get in the West is, uh, is cheaper. It's just the raw product. It's the same product. It's just the raw product, and that means it's cheaper. And monostyrene is what you thin it out with, and that's cheap too. So when I get the green resin, I go over here to my monostyrene bottle, and I have a chart, and uh, use the chart to get the right percentage, or you just dump it in and thin it out till it's the right consistency. You get the right amount of runniness and gooiness, and uh, so it works well for you. It's uh, not super critical. You don't want to put too much styrene in there or you're going to have a problem. Uh, your resin is not going to be a good formulation. So once you've got your uh, percentage amount of styrene to put in there, you got the right uh, thickness of your resin and you're almost good to go. Now this is my favorite part here. I got this uh, stuff that goes boom. It's called cobalt. C-O-B-A-L-T. And this is what's called a hardening accelerant. Now, it's called an accelerant because what it does is when mix, mixed with your hardener, the MEKP, it causes the resin to get hot. And the resin, when the resin gets hot, it becomes hard. Now, if you took this here and dumped it right in this bottle right here, I got to check to make sure my caps are on, you get a big boom. You could mix that with water and get a big boom too. And if you mix it with resin, you're not going to get a big boom. But... Uh, it's an accelerant. It's a semi-dangerous chemical. So what you do is you use it sparingly. So when you get your big bottle here, you get your percentage, and I always measure this stuff here in drops. So many drops per so much volume. Now you can put it into the big container, which is a lot safer, or you can mix it into your mixing pot, one or two drops per 100 grams or so. And you always want to put the hardener accelerant, the cobalt in, put it in the resin before you do anything else, because you want to thin the cobalt out. And uh, so it's not in there in a state that's uh, not mixed up. And you put your hardener in, and it goes boom. Now, it could go bang, boom, pop, pop, and all that stuff, and all that sounds like that, or it could be, it could be worse, depending on how much you put in. But if, if you put in a small amount drop by drop and mix it in, you're not going to have a problem. So that's the uh, basic thing. You use the uh, monostyrene mixed with your resin. 
and they use your hardener accelerant and the MEKP. And uh, the idea that why is it better? Well, in the West, people use uh, hardener accelerant too. It doesn't say cobalt on the bottle. It's some kind of fancy stuff they charge a lot of money for. And that cobalt here is cheap. So is the monostyrene. Uh, in the West, they, they're going to they're gonna stick it to you for everything. Here in Thailand, it's much cheaper to make boats. And everything is uh, a little bit harder to use, but in the end, you have more flexibility. And so if you're in the West and say, gee, I wish I had some of that cobalt, cobalt uh, you might be able to buy some. If you don't have the cobalt, you use the hardener accelerant. And the reason why you use it is, is to make your resin harden quicker, which may or not be a thing that you want. You don't want hardening in your spray gun. Or you don't want hardening in the pot. Or you don't want to get hardening in the lamp before, it's, uh, before you're ready for it to harden. But if you're in a cold climate, hardener, a hardener accelerant is the way to go. So uh, I like it here in Thailand at the resins, and uh, once I got used to it, I can measure it out fine. So this video is for basically people, like I say, in countries that get the unformulated resin. Now, uh, every resin shop should have this, even in the West. I call it my gel coat and resin formulation chart. And it's all the information that I need to know to measure out my... Uh, Hardener, mono, uh, pigment, MEKP for different formulations for usage for making boats. And every shop should have one. And uh, mine's a little bit bigger than some shops because I formulate my own resin because I have to. Now, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about this is going to help some people out in the West or anywhere. <laughs> Apples and oranges. Okay, uh, you go to YouTube and you see a guy measuring out his resin. He puts his cup on there just like I got here. There's some hardened, uh, hardened resin in there. I was using it earlier for glue. And so uh, you see the guy on YouTube and he's putting his uh, resin out. He dumps it in the cup and he puts it on there. And then he says, oh, I need 2% hardener. So then he gets a syringe and he fills up the syringe and he puts... What he thinks is 2% hardener into that cup that stirs it in and starts to work it. Well, what happens in a lot of these cases when he does that is he's mixing apples and oranges. And that's because of specific gravity. Now, if you took a, take a look at this uh, resin here, you can see how thick it is. Polyester resin, like any resin, is thick. Your hardener, MEKP, is thin. It has a different specific gravity. So if you want 2% hardener to resin, you measure it out by volume using a container like this, and you use your syringe. So you get uh, how many milliliters per milliliter? You get, you get apples. <laughs> so you're fine. You're good to go. But the problem is if you use a container like this and you start measuring it out using this and the syringe to get your 2%, well, you got a big gooey uh, container here, and you can't use it for very long, and uh, you end up throwing it away or using graduated uh, paper cups, which are a little bit expensive and not easy to use. So most people use a scale. You see them using the scale. And uh, then they measure out, and they use a syringe, and they're squirting with a syringe. They're using milliliters to grams. And they think they're getting the 2%. But most cases, they're not. And that's because, like I say, different specific gravities between the hardener and the resin, thick and thin. So I got this chart here that took me a long time to make up, my formulation chart. And uh, I hope you can see it here. It says MEK specific gravity, 1.1 grams per milliliter. So that lets you know if you've got one milliliter in your syringe, how much it weighs, 1.1 grams. So then you know you got uh, 100 grams here. And if you want 1%, you put just a little over one milliliter. And that gives you 1%. Normally, you're going to want 2%. So it's 2.2 uh, grams of the hardener in the syringe.
per 100 grams. So it's a little bit of math. That's all it is. I mean, it's, you don't need a calculator. I mean, you could. But uh, it's just figuring things out a little bit and not mixing apples and oranges and learning how to formulate your resins. And that's what boat building is all about. That's what resins and fiberglassing is all about, getting it right. Now, a lot of people just dump it in. They're used to doing it, and they just dump it in, and nine times out of ten, it's going to work out fine for them. But if you're working on a big, expensive boat, and you don't think about it, you make a mistake, and you think 1% instead of 2%, you might be screwed. Maybe not, but you might be screwed. So, especially if you're starting out, if you're in the west, I'd read that chart on the bottle. And if you're in the east, or in the Central and South America, and places like that, Spain and Portugal, <laughs> learn how to mix your resins, how to formulate them using monostyrene, cobalt, or another accelerant, and MEKP. So that's it for this video. I hope it was informative. If you have any questions, you know where to ask them in the comment section below. I hope I can get to it, and I'll try. So uh, have a good day, and don't forget to have fun. This is a quick update of the drill press that I've uh, been working on repairing. If you've seen the previous video about it, I derusted uh, parts of it, and now it's all done, and it's repaired in working order. Uh, I'll just give you a quick walk around what I did. Uh, the head here. I was expecting only two bearings in here, but there were four, so I had to replace those. This drill press was left out in the rain. That's why it's very rusty. So I got the head all working good, and then uh, it's missing a few parts. I put a bolt from the hardware store in here, rounded off the head, and it was missing a motor. So this motor here was from an old air compressor that I had. And so I put that on there. And it's also missing the pulley on the uh, motor. So I went to the uh, place where I buy used uh, equipment and I bought a used pulley, a new V belt. And that's working fine. And uh, then I, over here, I uh, replaced all the wiring inside the switch and I, I kept the old switch and it works fine. <laughs> installed uh, my son. He installed a switch and uh, we put a light bulb up in here so it shines down on the work table. And we basically uh, cleaned up the wiring and all that stuff and uh, made it usable. And uh, we had to de-rust a lot of stuff in here. I mean, uh, these posts where you uh, move the engine back and forth to tighten and loosen the, the pulley, we had to take all that apart. And, uh, it was a it was a lot of work, and all the nuts and bolts were rust, rusted in, and, you know, this uh, handle that locks uh, down on the shaft here, and basically we had to go through everything, take it all apart, and work on it, and all in all, I spent uh, 2500 baht, which is about $75 U.S., and it's an old work press, but it's a big one. It's pretty good. It's usable, and I like it, and uh, it's better than what I had before, which is nothing. So uh, thanks for watching the video. Uh, don't forget to have fun.